Hey everybody, just a quick message from me, what lurks beneath here. I wanted to let you all know that I have just very recently joined the Twitch program and I will be doing live stuff on that here fairly soon. So I will leave a link in the description below and you can go and check that out and I will be giving you all more updates on that. What that's going to look like is I'll be getting on there for maybe a half hour to an hour, Monday through Friday. I'm not exactly sure the times yet, but I will be taking user requests and reading stories live to all of you. So without further ado, here's the video. Just to start off with some backstory, my group of friends had started making a nasty habit of joking about the Wendigo. My friends Stacy and me didn't for a while, just due to the fact that we believed in the supernatural, but after a few months, it grew on us, not knowing that the Wendigo can actually be triggered by such things. We joined in, which was the biggest mistake ever. I had just moved into the country, and we enjoyed making trips into town to have a few drinks, which is about a 30 minute walk from my place to town. At night, the first 10 minutes after leaving the bridge that leads out of town is pitch darkness with no streetlights. After that, streetlights are very sparsely placed, which can cause for a very creepy walk without anything happening. So, with all that in place, let's continue. Stacy and I begin our night walking into town, get some beers, and have some fun. Shortly into the night, something slightly strange happens. We receive a phone call from her little sister at home, crying and scared because she saw someone sitting on my friend Stacy's bed. She calms her sister down and asks her cousin to check her room for her sister at home. Everything is fine. No one's in the room. Also, ghosts and weird things happening at her house were also very common, so a sighting like this was a very strange regular. We continue our night. Into the night, we meet a guy who seems pretty cool. He's riding a bike and tells us he's pretty drunk or something. We decide to hang out with him for a bit and wanting to meet people in town. A ways into our hangout, we are sitting on a park bench and the guy is just lying on the ground in front of us. Suddenly, my friend stands up and says it's time for us to go. I shrug and agree, and we get going. After getting away from him, she tells me the guy bit her ankle. The day after, she said she had teeth bruises on her ankle. Kind of flustered that the guy would do that, we continue our walk out of town. Finally, we pass the bridge, which is our last source of light for the next 10 minutes. We turn on our phone flashlights, and we turn on some music trying to ease the spooky feeling of being in pitch black darkness in the middle of nowhere. Suddenly, we hear a voice beside us, and we both jump. It's the same guy on his bike. He asks us if he can follow us until we reach the fork in the road. We need to go left, and he needed to go right. Still slightly creeped out, but almost at the streetlights and the fork in the road, we agree. Regardless, he had to go the way, so did we. After a bit of walking, we finally reach the fork in the road and the first street light. We sigh with relief, hoping he would leave, but he turns down our way instead of going the way he needs to go. And now at this point, we are thoroughly creeped out. We try to ignore it and keep walking, holding our breath, wanting to reach the next street light, which in some ways was away. Finally, after what felt like forever, we reach the next street light which is also for some reason a small graveyard. I hate my area. Once we reach the streetlight, the guy stops dead in his tracks and doesn't move any further past it. As we turn around, the guy looks like he has suddenly passed out on his bike, his head down and his shoulders slumped. I was about to say something, but my friend stopped me and said we really needed to leave him. I agreed, not wanting to be around him much long either. After a few seconds, I take a peek over my shoulder. He's gone. Vanished. The worst part is, even if he had turned around and started pedaling as fast as he could, we still would have been able to see him some ways down the road. I panicked but also slightly relieved he wasn't there anymore. We continue walking, trying to pretend we are not creeped out. Walking quickly from streetlight to streetlight, and finally, we reach my driveway. 
My driveway is a long road of darkness. We hadn't put any lights in yet to try and brighten it. We begin to walk slowly, holding our breath, some weird feeling of dread coming over me the closer and closer we got to my house, and the further into the driveway we entered. I don't know what came over us, but the sudden feeling of, you need to run, and you need to run fast, came over us at the same time. We took off bolting at the exact same time without having to say a word to each other. We got to my front door. I unlocked it quicker than I ever have before, and we get inside. Just as I'm about to close the door, this hellish scream or growl, whatever the sound is, came out of nowhere. I could hear it getting close to the door and steps, so I slammed the door closed and locked it, dropping to the ground in fear. We both sat there, holding our breaths, scared to even breathe. Fast forward a couple weeks, me and my Stacy had forgotten about what happened. Suddenly, it came up in conversation and we had tried to find the sound we heard. Nothing worked. We looked up every possible animal, even animals that weren't likely. We spent an hour on this until we decided to look up the sound of a wendigo. It was the only sound that fit perfectly. We don't joke or talk about it now. I won't. I hate to. Even writing this post made me feel scared to bring it up. After hearing stories and looking stuff up online, I'm fairly sure it was a Wendigo. Me, my son, and girlfriend were attacked by something. We were camping up in the northernmost area of Washington State. My girlfriend is incredibly superstitious, so she insisted we brought weapons. So I had my combat knife and a 12-gauge shotgun, and she brought a 22 rifle alongside a newly sharpened machete. Our son was just three years old at the time. She and I were set on edge from a park ranger, who seemed very tense and uneasy, who stopped us and, instead of confiscating our weapons, told us to be careful and stay safe, then sent us along our way to the camp. When we got there, we were informed that several visitors had spoken about some unnatural noises and a pale creature that would mimic voices and sounds of people who weren't talking or seeming to be distracted. I laughed and put the idea out of my mind, thinking to myself, there's no way. They're fucking with us, but I knew better. So we then reached the area we were going to set up camp. We immediately got a fire ready to light and set up our tent and bags. I fed my son as my girlfriend ate a snack. We decided to get a lay of the area, so me and my girlfriend hiked around for about an hour or so. I had one of those baby carrying backpacks and my son started getting real heavy. Everything seemed normal until I saw something down the almost path we were on. We walked closer to investigate and saw drag marks. It looked as if somebody had killed a buck. There was a hole outlined in the dirt with a small dried pool of blood as if someone grabbed it from the antlers and pulled. That wouldn't be possible for any man. The buck, or whatever it was, would have been way too big for that. Shaken, we rushed back to base camp and restarted the fire and hurried back into our tents. Too afraid to leave since it was dusk by now, and we stayed inside the tent, and my girlfriend and I put our son to bed. Eventually, probably from the exhaustion of fright, we fell asleep. What must have been hours later, I awoke to a faint rasping sound that sounded like a child crying. I gazed outside in confusion and saw the outline of a creature that seemed to be a buck standing over something. It seemed to be about 20 feet away, but at a closer glance had unnaturally long limbs for a buck and was eerily tall. In sudden fear, I unloaded two shots into the creature and heard a loud blood curdling cry. My girlfriend awoke screaming to the shots I had fired as I tried to explain what I had heard. To my surprise, the animal hadn't moved an inch. Then, I noticed the stains on the side of the animal. It looked like blood was running down the edge, and lots of it. It stared at me, deep into my eyes, as I became petrified with fear. A sinister feeling of dread fell over me, as if I knew I couldn't move. I thought to myself, what if it starts to bolt towards us? 
Just then, this tall, decrepit, demonic thing seemed to whisper something. I couldn't exactly tell you what it was saying, but it seemed to have said, I need more. Children. My girlfriend screamed, asking where our son was. We blacked out. In the morning, we awoke to park rangers at our campsite. We didn't see our son anywhere. We told the rangers that he was missing, and they started a search party. I explained what happened, and strangely, they seemed to believe us. The one who seemed to be older by at least a decade pulled along the one we met earlier and whispered something in his ear. I only heard a single line, and I'm not even sure if what I heard was correct. It sounded like he said, it's getting bolder. They didn't seem to want us by ourselves, so they waited with us while we continued, well, they continued the search. We stayed in a log cabin for three days with a forest ranger, when suddenly some rangers came into the cabin saying they could not find our son. My girlfriend started to sob, and I start to hate myself thinking that I could have done something if I wasn't frozen in fear. We rushed outside only to find some injured and frightened police officials. The rangers wouldn't tell us anything of what happened or what they saw, or why the cops were scared shitless. All we know is that we don't have a son anymore. I will never recover from this. On Thursday, February 17th, 2017, at around 16 to 1700, I believe I spotted a Wendigo in a wooded area behind my residence. I live in an area where Wendigos could and have been spotted, so I don't deny that it was a Wendigo. Anyway, I have found mutilated animals and horrible scenes of death, rot, and decay that would make even well-seasoned veterans throw up. The sights have been just horrifying, and this really supports my theory that something is back in those woods. For example, about one month ago, I found my second dead fox. Its head and spinal cord were about 30 feet downhill from the mangrove's mess that once was the body. Its body had its front left leg ripped off and large scratches in its chest and sides. Furthermore, it was disemboweled with its intestinal tract in the trees and bushes. There were also signs of a struggle because fur from another animal and some sort of black liquid were on the ground and under its nails. Now, I'm leaving out a lot of details, but those should paint a pretty good picture for you. Now to the juicy part of my experience with this terrible spirit. So let me lay out the land for you. My house is about 100 yards from a small stream that splits the wooded area in half. And on the far side of the stream, from my house, there are very large trees. So I was out there one day, and all of a sudden, I felt cold and uncomfortable, like I was being watched. I also became increasingly paranoid that someone or something was out there with me. So, I decided to head in. Plus, the sun was setting and dusk would soon be upon me. So, I was starting walking towards my house, which is, would mean I would have to walk uphill. So I start walking at first, and I was walking out of the woods like I was on someone's yard, and they had told me to get off. Not a fast pace, but moving with a purpose, you know? Then I kind of felt like someone was really looking at me. So I turned around and saw a large creature, about 80 yards or less. I'm not really sure of how far my house is from that stream, from me standing across the stream. It then proceeded to take a step towards me, and I'm not really too athletic, but I'm not mega weak. I would saw that if I had to run about 20 yards uphill through the woods, it might take me 30 to 40 seconds. Yeah, I ran out of those woods in about 10 seconds flat. It is the most I have ever been scared, and the adrenaline has ever flowed through me. Now that I know what you're wondering, could I have been dehydrated or having hallucinations? Well, I've never hallucinated once in my life and I was not dehydrated, because about 10 minutes prior to this, I drank an entire bottle of water, and I always make sure I'm hydrated before I go woodland exploring, and there's no way it was a tree, because every time I go out there, I go to where I spotted it. 
and there isn't a single tree small enough to remotely look like what I saw. Since then, I haven't spotted it, but I do hear it. It is believed by Native Americans that Wendigos call out for help just like a human would in order to lure people toward it. I have heard what sounds like a little girl calling for help out in those woods before. It is still terrifying to talk or think about. Could anyone please help me or tell me that I'm not crazy because I feel like I am? Growing up in the mountains of northern Georgia, camping and hiking were things that me and my brother did so often it was second nature. So anytime Ryan and I had a break from school, we would head straight for the woods. We packed our gear, let our parents know where we were, and that was that. No questions asked. We decided to camp about midways through Jack's River Trail, and it's a trail we knew fairly well, as we had used to use it a few times before to practice on for long hikes. We arrived at the trailhead around lunchtime, parked the car, got our gear out, and headed into the woods. We passed a few hikers as we moved along and asked them how the trail looked, and the answer was always the same. Wet. Jack's River Trail probably crossed the river 50 times as it went along its 17-mile-plus journey, and with the colder temperatures of late fall setting in, it was harder for the trail to stay dry. We moved deeper into the trail and started to look for a place to make camp. This is where Ryan and I made our first mistake. You see, Ryan and I have this rule. We don't camp near people, if at all possible. Call us paranoid, but the last thing we want is for someone to drag us out of our tents and into the woods to never be seen again. So we always camped a pretty decent spot ways off the trail and in the area that wasn't popular with overnight camping. Roughly two and a half hours or so, we found what we thought was the perfect place to set up for the two nights that we would be out. We came up to the horseshoe bend and ventured about a half mile off the trail into a clearing and set up there. We built a teepee fire lay for that night and pitched our tents on either side. After setting up and unloading, we decided to walk back to the trail and go exploring around some of the many swimming holes Jack's River had to offer. This was during Thanksgiving break, and I remember being surprised at how few people were on the trail. Maybe it was the weather, or the fact that this was early in the week, but there didn't seem to be anyone hiking, much less staying the night. Around 5 o'clock, Ryan and I headed back to camp to start our fire, make dinner, and settle in for the night. As soon as the sun began to set, the cold rushed in. We added more wood to the fire, sat close and just enjoyed conversation. Ryan was two years behind me in school. I was a senior, and he was a sophomore, but growing up, we had always been close. We always hung out in the same groups, played the same sports, and even the same hobbies, etc. Around nine, we were settled comfortably around the fire. I had just texted our mom to let her know we were safe and getting ready for bed and I remember we were talking about dreading going to our grandparents' house for Thanksgiving and having some awkward conversations we had each year with family we only saw on the holidays, when things start to get strange. We were no stranger to the sounds of woods, and these woods were full of animals, from deer to black bears and even the random wild boar. If you are in the woods enough, you learn to distinguish certain sounds, and what we were hearing I can only chalk up to as odd. What Ryan and I heard was what sounded like somebody sneaking around slowly just out of eyesight. With an animal walking on four legs, you hear a tighter group of steps, but what we were hearing sounded very distinct to what a bipedal human sounds like when walking slowly or trying to move without making too much sound. I remember we both pulled out our flashlights and shone it in the direction we felt the sounds were coming from. But that is what was so weird. Whenever we would fix our lights on a spot, we thought the sound were coming from the location of, the sound would suddenly change. It was as if there were multiple people walking around us. That's when the whistling started. At first, I thought it was the wind, and I remember thinking maybe the wind is just throwing leaves around, and what we are hearing is nothing 
about the wilderness around us. Ryan looked at me and asked if I was hearing that. I didn't answer and was trying to focus hard on each individual sound. Two consecutive notes with roughly a three to four second gap and then two more consecutive notes, over and over again. Ryan kept asking if I had heard that and I put my finger to my lips trying to keep him from talking. The fear I felt was incredible. My jaw was tight, my fist clenched, knowing I wasn't ready for whatever was out there, if anything at all. The whistling continued for what felt like forever, but thinking it through was maybe five minutes when Ryan finally yelled out into the darkness. Hey! Quiet. The whistling stopped. The crunching of woods stopped. Nothing. I was pissed. I looked at Ryan with a what the hell look, and he shrugged his shoulders. I had to do something, he said. I just shook my head. We sat there in silence for a few moments, and when the woods erupted with noise, something or someone was running in a circle around our campsite. The whistling came back, two consecutive notes with the same three to four second gap, and then two more consecutive notes. How could someone whistle this loudly without cracking while also running? I was done. I stood up, shining my flashlight in all directions, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever was screwing with us. Nothing. It felt close enough to touch, but we never saw a thing. That's when the movement stopped, but the whistling was still constant. It was so loud, inhumanly loud. I looked at Ryan and told him to call the police now. This is the part I will never forget, the part I never like to talk about. While Ryan was on the phone with the dispatcher and telling them our location and what was going on, I stepped around the fire towards my tent. Inside my bag, I had a six inch fixed blade that I always carried and thought I would feel a bit more comfortable with it in my hand, more than just my flashlight. As I went to unzip my tent, trying to keep my eyes toward the woods, I heard some movement directly in front of me. I swept my light up directly in front of me, and for maybe two seconds, I saw it. Whatever this person or thing was, it was about five feet up in a tree. Everything about it was long. Its arms, legs, neck, fingers, everything. And it was fast. As soon as the light hit it, it launched backwards off of the tree. I heard it land, but... It either jumped at an impossible distance or landed in a thicket because I heard it but never saw. I don't think I have ever yelled so loud. I ran back to where Ryan was and sat down. He kept asking me what I saw but I couldn't answer. I just kept thinking about what I saw and maybe 10 minutes later we saw a couple of flashlight beams coming through the woods and about three guys came into view asking if everything was okay. I settled a bit and started asking them if they had seen or heard anything. All they said was they heard a lot of movement and then heard my scream, and that's when they headed in our direction. I tried to explain what had happened without sounding crazy, but it didn't seem to work. One of the guys walked around a bit and came back and said he didn't see anything. Ryan told them that we called the police and roughly 30 minutes later, a park ranger finally showed up. Ryan and I tried explaining everything to him, but he just chalked it up to either a curious animal or maybe some campers trying to mess with us. Either way, Ryan and I decided we weren't staying there that night. We packed up our stuff and walked out of the woods with the ranger. He took our statement and we got in our car and drove home. Ryan and I don't talk about what happened that night, but neither of us have been back to Jack's River Trail and will probably never go back. A little backstory. I was 13 at the time, and I come from a family of native descent, and we believe in many things similar to the Wendigo and Skinwalker, the Whistling Woman like the La Lorana and the like. We also have what seems some would call spiritual gifts that allow us to see spiritual energy, like negative energy and evil spirits. These gifts are what allow us to see these creatures and spirits alike as well as being able to have connection to God and his angels. 
we had been wanting to go to another camping trip for ages. And after some debate, due to some of my nephews catching a bad cold, it was finally arranged. After arriving at the site, it was normal than any other trip for the most part. Except there were mat signs of bad luck, a terrible omen, dead birds on the drive. My seven-year-old brother almost falling outside of our moving car due to a lock malfunction. And during the last few days of the two-week vacation, strange things started happening. Food, drawers, cabinets, doors would all be open and random chairs and Tupperware would go missing. But we chalked it up to some rowdy teenagers at the other campsite, though we all knew it wasn't just some kids. This was some far more treachery, but no one wanted to admit that it wasn't as simple as wandering animals or some thieving people. Until some days later, when even stranger things started to occur, like hearing footsteps behind us stopping one step after we did, the feeling of being watched, and a strong rancid odor when being completely alone. Imagine feces mixed with hot, rotten meat and then thrown into a fire. Although these occurrences were a disturbance, it did not deter us from staying for the final two days, as we had been planning it for months. But one experience years ago, on the day right before our departure, still haunts me to this very day. I had been strolling through the forest while looking for firewood when I heard rustling in the bushes behind me. As this happened, it seemed that all life ceased around me because I could only hear my heartbeat and the lone heavy footsteps approaching me. Then I heard my name called from what seemed to be every direction, yet echoed from in front of me while also coming from behind. The voice calling me was a harsh, raspy, animalistic in tone, imitations of my sister, who had just recently left the trip due to stress only a few hours ago. This had sent horrendous chills down my spine, so I ran the fastest that I've ever had back down towards the campsite, while I heard the twigs and leaves crunching behind me. I had finally reached the campsite when the footsteps suddenly stopped. I was relieved and slumped over to the cabin stairs when I slipped on a rock, slipping out of the makeshift fire. It had caused my head to go straight into it. The blazing force of nature had almost burned my face when I just stopped mid-fall. I hadn't gained my balance, but it was as if just somebody was hanging on to me and pulled me back. I'm not sure what it was, but my family suggests that it was my guardian angel saving me from an early death. But after that experience, I have never been to the same campsite ever again and didn't go camping for a few years after that. Still, what really scares me the most from back then was when we had been leaving the site. I looked back from the car window and saw a figure standing at the tree line staring at me. It was lanky and looked starved to the point of having its skin wrapping tightly against its bones. But when I looked onto the pathway, the footprints were completely gone. And as I blinked, we rounded the corner and it seemingly vanished into thin air. This has left me questioning, what is those woods and was it a reality? But when my sister asked me why I was so shaken, I told her what I experienced and her face went pale. A scary gaunt figure had been watching us across the riverbank and then it had noticed her and ran away on all fours at a fictional speed, she shakily said, staying quite frightened after. 